Hi, my name is Cheryl Yoder, and I am a volunteer with AARP Nebraska. For the month of February, AARP has invited the Curator of Collections from the Hastings Museum to share four informational sessions with us on the topic of quilts. Depending on whom you ask, there are as few as 24 traditional quilt patterns, up to over 400. No matter the pattern, one thing is certain, each quilt illustrates the maker's ability to meld colors and prints together into a cohesive design. Along the way, they may incorporate pieces of a personal story or memory that makes the quilt more meaningful to them or the person for whom they're making it. In this four-part series, Teresa Kreitzer Hodson shares the beauty and history of some of the fantastic quilts held in the Hastings Museum's permanent collection. Today is part two of the series, and we will continue looking at the piece designs of crazy quilts. So many materials have been used to make these eclectic throws. Teresa will share one of the more unique pieces in the collection made from cigar ribbons, as well as some of the fun ways these types of quilts were embellished. You can view this four-part series on quilts from our AARP Nebraska Facebook page live every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Central Time during the month of February. After each event, we will save the recorded segments that we have aired on our Facebook page. Our next upcoming event on quilts will be featured on February 17th, and it will expand on the embroidery methods used in crazy quilts. This episode will also feature a number of signature quilts. In some cases, the signatures were embroidered into the quilt while others were simply written. One of the more interesting pieces in the collection is a signature quilt featuring names of veterans of the War of 1812, Civil War, and the Spanish-American War. Our final episode will be aired February 24th, and it will shift away from piece quilts to look at applique quilts. Teresa will finish up this series by sharing tips on how you can care for your own quilts and keep them preserved for the next generation. If you are watching this segment, please post a comment, like, or share our AARP Nebraska Facebook page so that your friends can watch and learn too. Now, let's get started by meeting Teresa Kreitzer Hodson from the Hastings Museum. Welcome, Teresa. Thank you again for the ARP's coordination with us to present these quilts that we have in our collection. These are permanent uh, parts of our collection. We have been collecting quilts for the duration of our museum for since 1927 and probably earlier when Brooking was doing his own thing. Um, so we have about 80 quilts in our collection and this is a great way for us to share um, out there with the community uh, the quilts that we have that we don't always get to present to everybody. Again, this is a four part series. This is the second part of this quilt series and I appreciate you joining us. Uh, this particular one, we are going to talk about crazy quilts. So let's get started. So crazy quilts, no one really knows where it originated from or whoever started doing this type of quilting. Um, but one of the things with crazy quilts is they do have a long and diverse and very rich history. Um, they use remnants of old clothing. They use linens. They um, even use parts of other quilts. All of these little scraps are pieced together to make these random shapes in random colors. Um, but the thing is, is they usually have some kind of a story. Uh, usually the person who makes it can remember, well, this is somebody's dress or this is somebody's um, quilt. Um, so they have some other meanings behind the uh, uh, actual quilting itself. These were usually made um, before industrial, uh, or usually made after the Industrial Revolution kind of eased the burden of women's work. Um, they didn't have to spend as much time doing housekeeping, so um, they could get with these crazy quilts and make just wonderful uh, piecing of fabrics together. Uh, there's heavily embroidered pieces, um, but they became wildly popular during the Victorian era, and so a lot of them are very dark. They have the elect 
eclectic uh, fabric pieces. Um, it's a very busy decor and all of this matches very well into the Victorian era. The first one I'd like to share with you um, is designed with a lot of finer fabrics. There are pieces of neckties in here, there's ribbons, there's silk, and there's even a little bit of lace incorporated into here. Uh, if you can um, kind of take a look, there's just lots of different shapes and pieces and they're all made into a block. So there are separate individual blocks in this quilt. Uh, there's about 20 to be exact. Um, and each one is very different from the one before it. This is an up close of a little bit of the work here. You can see some of the embroidery that is uh, done in between each one of the pieces as it was pieced together. That's the one thing about crazy quilts, there was no standard for stitching. So you could use about any kind of embroidery stitch that you wanted to piece this together. You could create designs. You see a letter R here. Uh, there's a fan, there's a little person. Um, so you could really just do a lot of fun things with this. These quilts were not usually made for bedding. Uh, they were intended to be for decorative uses and usually were hung in parlors or over the tops of chairs in parlors. Uh, this particular one, um, like I said, it does have neckties and things of that nature. The fabric itself is cotton, there's silk, there's satin, there's even some velvet in here. Uh, and this piece is not super large, it's 62 by 52 inches. The embellishments that were placed on these um, could be anything from embroidery to paint to buttons, anything to show off um, the skills of the maker. Uh, you even see like this little vase up here. Um, there are some uh, influences from the Asian cultures. Uh, a lot of times there was natural motifs. So the butterflies and the flower or the leaves and flowers um, are all seen in these. Embroidery itself became popular after the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia in 1872. Uh, the Royal School of Needlework uh, was very instrumental in that exhibit and kind of uh, set it up for something that became very popular for women to pick up and learn. This particular quilt was made by Mrs. F. W. Rinker. Uh, sadly, we do not know anything about this woman, um, not even where she was from. Uh, like I mentioned before, this quilt has uh, several blocks that have human figures. Uh, the one that is here on the right is styled after Katie Greenway, who was an illustrator uh, in England in the late 1800s. Uh, her work appeared in books that she published as well as magazines and even almanacs. Uh, her best work appears in books for children. Uh, and her work was widely known throughout England and the United States at that time. So for a, an artist to pick up on her style and incorporate it um, is not totally unusual. Uh, another motif that you see on the uh, left side of this quilt is the anchor. This motif you see in a lot of the crazy quilts and even some of um, just other uh, quilts they'll embroider or not embroider, but uh, incorporated into their quilting stitches. And at that time, the anchor meant um, that they had faith. And so you see different styles of anchors. We probably have a good dozen or more quilts in our collection that actually have some kind of an anchor motif uh, incorporated into it. This particular block, I just had to show you because um, of the image is so detailed of this dog and uh, you know, it just kind of shows the uh, different stitches that they used all the way around for each one of those pieces. There's just so much to look at um, and you see something new, I think every time you look at this particular quilt. Our next crazy quilt is not in the greatest of condition. It measures 70 by 61 inches uh, and it's made of silk, satin, velvet, and cotton. Uh, a lot of the silk is uh, faded away. 
a lot of times in these crazy quilts, they use something called weighted silk. And the process to make that silk weighted or um, a little bit heavier actually makes it deteriorate quite quickly and easily, especially if it's in sunlight. So you can see if you look closely around here, there's a lot of just like it looks like just threads strung across. Uh, that was probably a solid piece of silk at some point, and it's just deteriorated naturally um, through that weighting process. Another interesting thing about this quilt is the edging. Uh, it has very nice uh, lace work done all the way around. You can't see it very well on the bigger piece. Um, it just didn't show up. So I have a close up here, and that goes all the way around. It. Some of it's in kind of good condition. Some of it is not, as you can kind of see that left side's a little bit tattered there, um, but it does go all the way around the quilt. This is a close-up. You can see some of the different motifs. Again, that natural um, history stuff. There's the strawberries, there's leaves, there's flowers. Um, you can also see some of that deterioration of the fabric a little bit better. Again, this quilt shows the different pieces that were um, put together and embroidered in between. Uh, again, a lot of different uh, designs and styles were used uh, to make this quilt. This quilt also has a very interesting history. Um, it was made by Hepzibah Martin Mar Masterson uh, in the 1880s. Hepzibah was born in Cambridge, England. England in 1846, and a few late, years later, her parents brought her and her brothers to the United States. By about 1862 or so, the family had filed a claim for land south of the Platte River here in Nebraska, and what at that time was part of Adams County and later was um, switched over to Hall County. The family's life in 1864 is a well-known story uh, in this area because she is the sister of the Martin brothers who were the two boys that were pinned together when the Cheyenne and Arapaho made a concerted effort to attack people along the Oregon Trail uh, throughout Nebraska and um, from the tip of Colorado all the way through Nebraska. So in August of 1864, the boys and their father were out haying in one of the meadows when the tribes came through and they pursued uh, the father back to the house. But the boys were actually shot through with the arrows and fell from their horse, uh, thinking that they were dead. They left him there, but the family um, didn't know they were alive and they let, fled the area to Fort Kearney. When they came back, they actually found the boys still pinned together with arrows uh, in their barn. The Both boys uh, lived and uh, like I said, Hepzibah was their sister. Again, just kind of showing some of the work that she did on this quilt. Um, the flowers, I love the sunflower in this. It's um, very realistic um, and very pretty. Um, but she did a lot of fine uh, quilting and embroidery in this. Our next crazy quilt is actually in pretty good condition and uh, has a very uh, pretty and heavy border. And most crazy quilts do not have batting in them, but this particular one does. Um, so it is a little bit thicker than a lot of the crazy quilts. Um, again, no distinct patterns, uh, lots of textures and embellishments that make them attractive, uh, like this one. This one is almost square. It is 60 by 64 inches. Uh, it is silk and satin for the most part um, and was completed somewhere around 1887. Uh, in our previous episode, I had mentioned that the museum had had a quilt survey done in the early 19th. 1990s by uh, Sandy Fox. And she noted when she looked at this that she felt that there were two different skill levels uh, of work that were in this quilt, which makes perfect sense because our records indicate that this quilt was made by um, the mother and possibly the sister of Julia Green Bell. Uh, Julia was not from Hastings, but had a friendship with Albert Brooking, the museum's founder. And we actually have quite a few pieces from our uh, from her collection in ours. Again, if you take a look, you see some of those natural motifs, the flowers. Um, this one has an awful lot of birds in it. Uh, you can see an owl here and there's another butterfly and there is a couple of uh, people represented as well. 
The stitching that she did uh, in between each one of the pieces um, is just remarkable. Um, well, both ladies did. Uh, this is just a very good example of the variety of embroidery stitches that were used to make a lot of these crazy quilts. Something else that uh, was done to embellish these crazy quilts was sometimes to paint on some of these motifs. So the two floral motifs that you see in the center of both of these pictures, instead of being a part of the fabric, they are actually painted on. Um, you can kind of tell when you feel it. Um, otherwise it does kind of look, particularly the one on the right, does really look like it was printed on when the fabric was made, but you can tell uh, by the touch that uh, they were actually applied later. And we are moving on to our next crazy quilt. This particular one is made of silk and velvet. It is also almost square. It is 58 by 61 inches. Uh, you will see over on the left-hand side of this quilt uh, some pretty bad damage. And we will talk about damage from uh, different elements more in our last segment of this series. But this is probably done by light. Um, it really literally shredded the, the fabric in that one spot where it probably um, was exposed to a window or perhaps a lamp um, a little too long. Something interesting that I find about this quilt is looking around the edges and it's almost got that uh, um, nine patch quilt block style and with the littler blocks that make up those uh, bigger ones that definitely are the nine patch. You can see that a little closer here, as well as some of the embroidery techniques. And the picture that I have over here on the right, it just amazes me because these pieces are actually quite small and all that embroidery that's in between. A lot of those pieces measure only about one inch wide by about two inches long. So those are very tiny pieces and some um, pretty elaborate um, embroidery work that was done to put that together. Like the others, again, you see the natural elements. This one has butterflies, it has flowers and people. It also includes another one of those anchors and it has a ribbon. Um, not really sure what this ribbon was for. Um, I had tried to do a lot of research on it and could not come up with um, anything other than the lips, lips however rosy must be fed uh, was something that um, Ovid had written in a poem. And so I don't know if this was from some kind of a literary meeting. Um, still trying to figure that out. Something else that was done in this quilt is there are a couple different areas where the flowers that were um, added are actually ribbon or pieces of fabric that were bunched up. So on the picture on the left, um, it's a little harder to tell, but that is raised up. Those pink flowers are actually additional material um, that were kind of fluffed up and sewn together um, to give it more of a three-dimensional aspect to it. I also really like this star because it just shows the different colors um, of thread that they had available to them at that time. This is another crazy quilt that we have in our collection and it is not as luxurious as the others and it is probably not uh, something that would have been displayed. This is really a working quilt, uh, meaning that they use this quilt quite heavily. Uh, the fabric in it is not the fine silks and satins that you see on the others. Um, it is cotton, it is definitely pieced together from uh, rags of probably clothing and dresses and um, just anything that they had available to them. It is very well worn. Um, it's also very thick. Again, another reasoning for um, this being used as a blanket, uh, the batting that is in here um, is very thick. This would have been a very, very warm blanket. Um, and you can just see the wear and tear um, and the use that stained this quilt uh, through its life. 
They did do some embroidery on it. Um, each one of those pieces has some embroidery in between. And then um, there are some different motifs that are included. Um, here's a couple of close-ups on these. Um, I think it's interesting on the left-hand image across the top of the border there, uh, there's a whole series of French knots um, that they just lined up there to kind of give it that, uh, I don't know, not really a polka dotted look, but uh, um, just something a little bit different than what they were doing in a lot of the other quilts. This quilt is also interesting in the fact that um, there are some names here that we actually could research and find out more about this family. This quilt was donated to the museum by a, a distant relative of the maker. Um, after doing some genealogical research, uh, some of the information that was presented to us at the donation is a little questionable, uh, but what I can say with certainty is that Arthur and Sarah DeFord were married in 1870 in Iowa. Uh, they had four children and their names are on this quilt. Their names are Fred, Delmar or Del, Cora, and Bird. Uh, their names are embroidered into this quilt. And uh, so it was probably the mother who made this quilt or possibly a grandmother, uh, probably something that each one of those children used. In 1880, they lived in Keokuk, Iowa, and by 1900, they had moved to Wallace, Nebraska. Uh, the children married, and this quilt was likely handed down through Bird and her daughter, Ovid, uh, and it's, uh, or not Ovid, Ovida. Ovida's sister-in-law is the one that donated it to the museum in, 18, or in 1989. Um, so again, a little bit of the story is uh, a little bit confusing from what was given to us when it was donated, um, but just kind of doing some genealogy, we can make some connections there uh, as to the history of this interesting quilt. This particular piece is called a cigar ribbon quilt, and it is a very uh, colorful, yet very delicately and actually kind of poorly made quilt. This piece isn't big enough to be a throw or anything. It was for display, maybe as a table runner. Um, it's l quite long, but pretty narrow. But it's made out of cigar ribbons. These ribbons were used to tie up big bundles of cigars. And so the cigar makers in the heyday of the crazy quilts in the late 1870s on through the 1920 um, enticed buyers with these colorful ribbons um, that they used to keep their bundles together. People would collect these ribbons and then started putting them into crazy quilts. Now, I don't know that there's anybody out here out there that made one quite like this, but this one is entirely of the cigar ribbons. Um, there is, I think I counted about 20 different, uh, maybe 25 different um, companies represented here. Irma Cruz of Hastings is credited for making this quilt. Um, she was never married, so I don't know if she just had people collecting these ribbons for her, uh, if it was her brother or her father who collected them. Um, but like I said, there's, there's quite a number in here. Our monogram is the predominant ribbon that you see in this quilt. Um, but there's others, you know, the after dinner, the Santa Teresa, Lord Derby, uh, Lounders. And like I said, there's 20 to 25 different uh, uh, companies represented. Again, in between each one of the ribbons, there is embroidery stitches. And then the edging is also made out of ends of those ribbons. I want to thank you again for joining us today. This has been a few of the crazy quilts that we have in our collection. And I want to thank AARP for allowing us to share this uh, with you guys through their platforms and appreciate all of the work that they do to help us make this possible. Tune in next time for our third session, which will be on embroidered quilts and signature quilts. Thank you and see you next time.